First of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a, it's a privilege and honor to, uh, to start this uh, meeting, especially when it's uh, very focused on um, muscle cells uh, and then giving the opportunity for me to say a few things about things that are around the muscle cell and in close proximity. But thank you for that. I think it's fair to start and say that I will not dis debate with you that the contraction of the muscle cell itself is the most important activity in order to make us move, exercise, or do other types of activities. But it's also fair to say that in addition to having the muscle cell to contract, we need some connective tissue uh, like the intramuscular connective tissue, like the tendon, in order to get a movement of a limb, in this case, illustrated as the bone. And also other connective tissues like cartilage and ligaments are helping in getting the movement optimal. And I'll try to illustrate it here, like a part of a bike where you can see that the muscular force that's put into the pedal should eventually end out in a movement of the wheel. And you can see where the intramuscular connective tissue and the tendon plays an important role. And I think for many years, we have considered these connective tissues like the tendon intramuscular connective tissue as very mechanically, like which they are, but they also, and what I would like to do today is convince you that they are not necessarily inert tissues but they can actually adapt to physical activity or lack thereof. Another point I wanna stress before I start is that we all appreciate that if something goes wrong in muscle, might be muscle loss with aging, sarcopenia, or metabolic disorders in the muscle here illustrated as insulin resistance, we have a kind of a disease situation. But likewise, we also have that in the connective tissue, obviously bone you're aware of, but also in tendon where not only tendon ruptures, but also tendon overload injury, tendinopathy is a major clinical problem. And the way I set up this figure is also to illustrate that I think in the future, we need to think a little bit across the different tissues that the muscle cell and the fibroblasts from the tendon, they potentially interact uh, in order to form a well-functioning unit. And it's illustrated here where the muscle strain injury is typically occurring in the muscle tendon interaction. And as we'll try to show you later, there is an interaction play between these things, but also interactions between tendon and bone and bone and muscle are important. So let's get started. If we look at the connective tissue, there are several uh, uh, proteins and the most dominating one is collagen. That is over by more than 70% of all proteins and connective tissue is collagen, which by the way is the most dominant uh, molecule in the entire human body. So for simplicity for today, I will focus on collagen and its turnover and its adaptability to training and physical activity. And knowing that I, there are a lot of things which I haven't mentioned today that could actually also be of importance. And the first question to ask is what does acute exercise, inactivity or, or physical training, how does this influence the uh, connective tissue in tendon and intramuscular uh, connective tissue? And uh, a little bit later, just a few words on what happens if we get too much loading. And we'll start with the uh, tendon which is built up like is illustrated here, where the basic structure will be the collagen molecule and then built in in fibrils, which is bundled then in fascicles and which then will be the entire tendon. So I'll start a few words on the tendon and in a few minutes, I will go over to the intramuscular connective tissue. So the first thing is, does physical activity stimulate to new formation of collagen? And the first indirect evidence for that would be to look at the mRNA for collagen to see whether anything responds to physical activity. And it certainly does. Here is in an animal model, in a rat model, where you can see that uh, four days of uh, repeated loading resulted in, an, in a rise in mRNA for collagen type one in this case. And you can see interestingly that where we in, mus in muscle cells very often see a difference in expression 
between if we have done concentric or eccentric exercise, uh, it appears that in tendon, it doesn't matter whether the contraction is concentric or eccentric, there's still a quite marked upregulation. Also in humans, we normally find a small upregulation in mRNA for collagen type one here illustrated after one hour of acute kicking exercise. So there are indications that something is dynamic inside the tendon. And if we take it more directly, we can infuse uh, uh, labeled, uh, non-radioactive labeled isotopes, uh, stable isotopes here in this case, C14 proline, which then will be taken up uh, by the tissue and incorporated in this case in hydroxyproline. And if you infuse this and you then take biopsies from tendons to get the tissue out, you can see that the more incorporation there is, the more new formation of collagen has taken place. And in this case, it's one hour of kicking where you then have sampled from one leg, uh, the patella tendon, and you compared it with the other leg, which has not exercised. And you can see here, like in skeletal muscle, the protein synthesis goes up with exercise and 24 hours after exercise, you have a marked increase in new formation of collagen. So as said it down here, the new collagen is made as a result of mechanical loading, but this doesn't tell us whether it will end in new tendon structures or whether it will just occur, let's say in a small fraction of it, or it is in the entire tendon. So in order to get a little bit closer to that and not just say that there is something happening in the tendon, we wanted to make an estimate of how much uh, turnover is there of neck of connective tissue in tendon. And we took the advantage of the unfortunate event of atomic bomb trials, which was very pronounced in the late 50s, early 60s, after which it was banned. And what occurred with these atomic bomb trials was that the C14 content in the atmosphere was actually rising to almost the double le uh, level year, the, around the whole entire world. And now after the banning of these trials, you can see we're gradually coming back to the level of C14 in the atmosphere fear that we had previously. Since the half-life of C14 is extremely long, we can use this to find out how old tissue is. And the C14 uh, is taken up in plants and either eaten uh, by humans or by animals eaten by humans, and that will then go out in the human tissue. So, if we have a, a tissue like here over on the left side, like the islands, where very little happens after you're born, you can see that the red curve here is very much mimicking the black curve showing the atmospheric C14. And this illustrates that whether you're born in 1920, 30, 40, 50, things stay as they are when you were born. You are born with a C14 in the atmosphere. And this would indicate that the islands does not happen have any turnover after uh, you are born. Whereas another tissue like the skeletal muscle, which obviously is, is uh, dominated by the muscle cell themselves, there you can see dots down here, which really illustrates that when a sample is taken in year 2000, the content of C14 in the muscle is exactly as the same as the atmosphere here in year 2000, disregarding that this person was born in 1970, where the C14 atmospheric concentration was here. So this illustrates that there is a rapid turnover of the tissue and an exchange. And you can see, long story short, that the tendon is somewhere in between. It's not on the flat line and it's not following the black line here. And if you do some calculations, you can see that there is a shift a little bit to the left, meaning that basically you are having a dynamic connective tissue when you are growing into the end of puberty, uh, whereas after that, you have a relatively stable situation. So you have uh, in, in a tendon that is measured, you have a 95% of the collagen in a tendon is turning over until you stop your growth. After that, you basically have no turnover in this large portion of the uh, tendon connective tissue. And by the way, the same takes place in, in, uh, uh, in cartilage. You uh, then have a portion of it where you have a faster turnover. So the two things fit together. The measurement I just showed you of turnover is occurring in a smaller fraction of the tendon. And the question is now, where in the tendon uh, do things take place? And some of the data from showing Thorpe's group in, in, in England 
um, has shown that maybe from stainings that the more active parts in the tendons are between these fascicles and not so much in the fascicles itself. And some recent data have shown that there is a higher protein dynamics in this interfascicular space rather than in the fascicular itself. And we've recently done some studies where we have used stable isotopes to see how much is taken up in the tendon. And we could show that a certain amount was taken up in the entire tendon. And when you then treat the tendon, so you remove all the things between the fascicle, so you only have the fascicles left, then there will be almost no turnover. So at least at this point, I would say that the dynamic turnover that happens with the exercise is happening between the fascicles and maybe in the outside of uh, the tendon. So much for the tendon. Now going to the skeletal muscle and the fact that in skeletal muscle, even if it's a small fraction, still between five and 8% of the skeletal muscle is connective tissue. And when we measure turnover in the skeletal muscle, we were of course challenged by the fact that some of it happens maybe in the endometrium, which is the smallest part surrounding the muscle cell, but other parts of turnover could happen in the perimetrium uh, between, between groups of muscle cells. And you can see here this nice picture from Rick Lieber's group, and he will later today talk more about the mechanical properties of it. So, so looking at that, we can only get a gross measurements of the connective tissue turnover in, uh, in muscle. And here we have again, one hour of leg kicking using stable isotopes. Before it was young males, now it's young uh, females where you have a resting situation and you then have the uh, new formation of protein 24 hours after exercise. And in the top panel here, it's muscle fiber myofibrillar protein. That's the contractile protein. That's very well known that that will increase. And the two different bars here just illustrate measurements taken in the follicular phase or the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle. And down here, you can then see the muscle collagen protein synthesis. And this again shows you that two things. One is that the, there is even at the basal level, there is some new formation of collagen in the site, the uh, muscle, but it's smaller than the renewal of the myofibular protein. That's to be expected. But you can see that the rise with exercise is pretty pronounced in both the contractile muscle tissue, but also in the muscular connective tissue. So already here we have a glimpse that the intramuscular connective tissue might be more active than the, um, than the, the connective tissue in the tendon. The next question, of course, is like with strength training, how much is needed in order to stimulate um, that exercise can stimulate this muscle protein synthesis? And here we've done an experiment, which is quite old, but uh, it illustrates uh, an approach where we have uh, one leg uh, doing regular strength training. That's what we call heavy here, eight repetitions, 70% one RM within a, a period of 30 seconds. And the other leg was doing, you can say light uh, training with relatively large uh, amount of repetitions, but only 15, 16% of one RM. And so that the two exercises for the two legs were the total amount of work was exactly the same, but one leg was doing more intense exercise than the other. And what you can see here is if you look at the increase in myofibrillar fraction or the synthesis rate in the contractile protein, that is to be expected. It goes up from resting to three to six hours after exercise. You can see here with the regular the strength training here going up from this level up to this level. And there's also some smaller increase, even with the very light uh, exercise here, even in the contractile proteins. But look at the connective tissue inside the muscle. It looks like it is stimulated as I showed you before, but it doesn't seem like there is any difference whether you have a very high intensity or you have a lower intensity repeated over many times. So at least this tells us that the adaptability of the intramuscular connective tissue is not as intensity dependent as the contractile proteins uh, in muscle. I'm going to show you an example of where uh, muscle contractile protein and connective tissue can differentiate between each other. And this is an example where growth hormone was administered in young healthy individuals over 14 days. And then the myofibular protein synthesis was measured before and after some uh, one hour of leg kicking. In this situation, you can see there is not 
So much of the expected increase in protein synthesis in the contractile protein, maybe because the exercise was of too low intensity. But over here, you can see that in the placebo situation, exercise increased the collagen protein synthesis inside the muscle, as you saw in the slide before. And, but the interesting thing here is that growth hormone makes this even more pronounced. So even in the resting state, if you give growth hormone, you will have a stimulated uh, collagen synthesis inside the muscle, and it will even be more pronounced if you do exercise, despite the fact that growth hormone does do absolutely nothing to the uh, muscle growth itself in young, healthy individuals with normal growth hormone production. And to take it even further, here you have the comparison of what I just showed you, just depicted in a little bit different way in the resting state where growth hormone would stimulate the muscle collagen and during exercise where it stimulates even more. Compare this to the changes that occurred in the same experiment in tendon. You can see that growth hormone also stimulated the synthesis rate in tendon, but not to the extent that muscle collagen was stimulated. So taken together, there is a sign that the dynamics of the intramuscular connective tissue is a little bit more pronounced than it is in the tendon. If we do very heavy exercise, we really will challenge both the muscle cell and the connective tissue. And this is a, a rather old experiment where we tried to, to use the two legs in different ways. In one leg, we would do uh, voluntary exercise, eccentric contraction, where you were forced back, but you would try to withhold it and you would have very heavy eccentric exercise. And then another situation with the other leg that had the same thing done, but this time you didn't do voluntary exercise, but you stimulated the muscle. So it was electrically induced uh, exercise. And then again, eccentric contraction, 200 contraction, very intense, a lot of release of CK and a lot of soreness. But in the voluntary state, we could see, you might not appreciate it here, but we could see some damage of the connective tissue. But as you can see, barely no damage of the muscle cell itself. So in the voluntary situation, it looks like the connective tissue is trying to protect the individual muscle cells. Whereas in the stimulated place, you could see a lot of cells that are very damaged. We have a lot of set band damage uh, in this situation. And if we look closer at the signaling in these two uh, types of exercise, you can see that in the voluntary state, you have a very a much smaller degree of muscle cell damage uh, and regeneration and also of other responses, whereas this is much more pronounced in the stimulated place. But notice that when we measure the signaling pathways, almost the same things are happening both in the voluntary state and the stimulated place. The intramuscular connective tissue is heavily loaded and is really responding dynamically in this situation. The last piece I want to show you with acute exercises, I've talked a lot now on protein synthesis. I haven't talked about degradation and how much tissue is degraded. And you can measure this by using heavy water and you can administer that for several days, for several weeks. And then the deuterium will equilibrate with uh, alanine. So you will get an internal labeling and it will take some time before it comes up. But if you wait long enough, you've saturated the tissue. And if you then stop you can see a washout from the tissue illustrated here, where you then can see how quickly does this labeling of alanine get out of the tissue as an indicator of breakdown. And it's still challenging, especially to use it in, in humans and get very accurate measurements, but I'll just show you some data here on, on rats where you can see that the breakdown, like the synthesis, is expected here for the myofibrillar protein in the soleus and extensor genitorum longus as these values also in the myocardial myofibrillar um, level, you can see. And what you can see here is that the collagen turnover or breakdown in this case, both in skeletal muscle and in cardiac muscle is lower than the uh, breakdown of the contractile protein, but it's still by far higher than the turnover, the breakdown we can see in the patella tendon. So it tells us that the um, both for synthesis and degradation, the intramuscular connective tissue is quite uh, dynamic in this situation. So taken together, you can say that dynamic loading can stimulate collagen protein synthesis and degradation in a smaller pool, most likely between the fascicles and humans, and stimulates intramuscular connective tissue markedly. 
Connective tissue turnover seems higher and more adaptable to exercise in skeletal muscle compared to tendon. Okay, let's go the other way and say, what happens if we lack mechanical loading? This is a study that uh, Marco Narici did with Michael Rennie's uh, group here at DeBoer as the first author showing that three weeks of immobilization will actually decrease the uh, tendon collagen uh, uh, synthesis rate. And you can see here that normally I showed you before there was an increase with exercise, but you can see if you have three weeks of immobilization, you're basically shutting down completely the new formation of collagen in the small pool of uh, tendon. Here we have an experiment where we have tried with immobilization for two weeks and we show exactly the same with tendon collagen synthesis. And as we believe that maybe inflammation was involved in part of this process, we also treated people with anti-inflammatory drugs for two weeks heavily and we saw absolutely no difference in the reduction. So blocking the inflammatory pathway is not gonna inhibit this decrease in new formation uh, of uh, collagen. If we take it a big a step further, we can try to mimic a tendon by making artificial tendons from human cells. We can take human fibroblasts uh, and then try to put them up in this system where we have some pins sitting here. And then within 14 days, it will form a, a tendon-like structure, tendon construct that looks very much like a normal tendon. It's not as uh, as strong, but it's a mimic of a human tendon. And then ask the question, is there a difference between leaving this tendon under tension or by cutting it? And so to speak, making inactivity here. And you can see up here that the expression of collagen type one is at some level with the tensed tendon, but it goes down much more markedly if you cut the uh, tendon in this situation. And this is also shown in another way here. Here is the normal situation here. You have cut the tension or detension or released it. And you can see that there is a decline here. If you take a normal tendon, which is have tension and you add TGF beta one, that will stimulate collagen formation. But if you have released the tension, you cannot rescue this by TGF beta. So it really indicates that tension is important for connective tissue in order to express its normal things. And tenomodulin, is a phenotypical marker of tendon, and you can see exactly the same picture here. So you can say that the a tendon or a connective tissue that is not under tension, it will lose its characteristics, and you can even see a disorganization within very few days in this situation. So lack of mechanical stimulation of tendon and of muscle will decrease the collagen turnover in humans, and lead at least for the tendon to structural changes in vitro. The third part of evidence I wanna give you here is the question of physical training. What if we train for a long time? And I've taken two examples here for one from tendon and one from muscle, which try to illustrate this. The first one is a situation where we've taken long-term trained people who've trained all their lives and they, have, they are doing exercises where they predominantly load one leg or at least one quadriceps more than the others. And a typical example would be fencers or badminton players. And if you measure their strength, they're somewhat stronger on the dominant leg, which is in front when they have to do the break movements. And if you compare these individuals, you can see that um, at least at the proximal and the distal end of the patella tendon, not so much in the middle, there are some indications that you have a little bit of a bigger tendon in this situation. And we believe that this is probably the strongest evidence that it's not pure selection, but that it is probably long-term training that affects it. But overall, by at large, tendon size changes are very small and with, uh, with training in this situation. Let's move to the intramuscular connective tissue and give you an example from people who have trained all their life and in this situation, I've taken an example of having people who are very experienced in long distance running. This means it's not strength trained people, but they have, these ones have been running for 30 years, 45 times a week, approximately up to 50 kilometers uh, per week. And they've done that most of their life. They're called old here, but they're in fact only around 63 years old. And we also have some young individuals of 25 years old who are either 
uh, well trained for many years or are sedentary. We are then comparing the 63 year old with people who have not been running. And as you can see here, despite the fact that they are long distance runners, if you look at the muscle cross section area, you can see that both aging has an effect, but also that training has an effect that even if it's endurance training, long life endurance training, it looks like you come out with a larger muscle cross section area. And I think it's interesting to see that a young untrained at 25 has the same muscle cross section area as an old 63 year old train, which is not that far from the situation that you would see also with uh, strength uh, training in this situation. If we look at the signaling in these uh, people from muscle uh, 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 biopsies, you can see in regards to muscle, if you take the, the, the left panel here, there's with myostatin, there's the expected a drop with training in myostatin expression. And you can also see a small drop uh, with age in this situation. And on the, let's say, degradation part of the site, you can see that, that FOXO is higher in elderly people, not so much seen any influence of training. But on the other hand, with MRF, you cannot see the big change with age, but you can see a, a, a lowering uh, with, uh, with training in this situation, uh, favoring uh, the uh, the less loss of, uh, of contractile protein or breakdown of it. And if you look at the collagen over here, you can see that there is a drop, not a rise, but a drop in collagen expression with aging. That was a little bit surprising. And even more so, it doesn't look like the expression is really markedly influenced, maybe a little bit uh, with, uh, with training itself. So that was a little bit of a surprise for us in this situation. So, but expression is one thing. Let's look at the, the picture. Let's look at the tissue. And this is a, a biopsies from, from the uh, vastus lateralis muscle in, in young, untrained, young, trained, old, untrained, old, trained. And you can see that just by the eye, there's not that many differences. And if we try to, to stain it and try to integrate the density, you can see that the serious red, which is staining the connective tissue as such, or specific staining for collagen, doesn't really show any difference in this situation, at least evidenced here. These are endurance Five minutes left. This, yes, uh, this is the endurance master athletes and the untrained uh, old people. You have to remember they were not uh, overweight people. They were people who were selected to made, match the controls for BMI. And they were um, not representative necessarily for the, uh, for the general population. So if we look at the, the picture then from young and old people, if the collagen content with the endometrium is probably the same, it also looks like the perimetrium is about the same. But what we found, and this is just a very small tendency, is if anything, you can see more subdivisions of the perimetrium with the elderly. But it is really a tendency. So it is really a small change that actually occurs with aging. And if so, if you're very healthy, even if you don't train or you train, it doesn't look like the intramuscular connective tissue structure really changes uh, a lot with, the, with the, the age. And finally, if we look at the uh, subcutaneous uh, area of tissue or taking the non-contractile intramuscular tissue, you can see here that the subcutaneous tissue was always lower if you are in a trained situation. The surprising thing was there was no age-related difference here, but remember these were very healthy untrained. So it really tells you that subcutaneous tissue can be influenced by both uh, lifestyle and also by training and not so much by aging per se. And if we look at the non-contractile intermuscular connective tissue, you can see that in this situation, there is an effect both of training and aging. So you have an accumulation here of the intramuscular connect, uh, tissue, not necessarily connective tissue, but a mixture of connective tissue and fat. And you can see that that can be reduced by training again, bringing it back to this uh, level. So taking this together, long time physical training is associated with increased tendon size and with an unchanged collagen content of skeletal muscle, but with lower non-contractile intramuscular area most likely due to downregulation of fat. And to just the few last minutes here, I just want to put it into perspective of having injuries, the muscle strain injury, the 
the injury of the myotendinous junction, the tendinopathy uh, situation. And if we start with the acute muscle strain, where you can see here with contrast that it occurs in this area, this is really an injury which occurs in the interface between the muscle, here is an EM picture, and the connective tissue of the tendon down here. And you can see up here, that typically this is the gastrocnemius, this is the soleus, and you can see that these muscle strain injuries very often don't affect the muscle that much, but more is a rupture between the tendon and the muscle. And recently we showed that just waiting one week of delay in onset of rehabilitation would put you back for three weeks on how fast you can come back to sports in this situation where those who started early rehabilitation, they came back after two months, whereas the others spent around three months before they were back with these very severe injuries. And the interesting part here was that we could not see any difference whatsoever in the recovery rate of the muscle mass, neither in recovery of muscle strength. So it's not necessarily just a question of muscle mass, but maybe of the connective tissue. And I think it's interesting that if you take out the exudate from a muscle injury where you can see here, and then also take plasma from the same patient and try to add this to isolated human muscle cells, either fibroblast or myoblast, then you will see that the myoblast, they don't care if they get plasma or this exudate, but whereas the connective tissue fibroblast, they respond much quicker in terms of proliferation when they get the exudate there than plasma. So there's a reason to believe that this activity locally in the tissue has an, an important factor for recovery after uh, muscle strain injury. And the last piece is uh, talking about the tendon and the overuse there. Whereas recently it has been shown that like in all other tissues almost, there's a circadian regulation. So there's several genes which are regulated in a time-wise fashion or 24-hour fashion. And more recently, Chloe Young, a postdoc at our lab who came from, from Manchester before she left there, just published this where she showed that there is an indication that in the tendon, there is a turnover of the collagen, uh, they, it's called chronomatrix, which is only a small part of the tendon extracellular matrix. And you can see over time that the collagen secretion seems to be different at nighttime from uh, daytime in this situation. So it's more very likely, and we can also see that there is a shift of turnover uh, from day to night, so to speak, a homeostasis in this situation. And this shift of size of these different fibrils can also be seen in humans where we've measured in the morning and in the evening that there is kind of a shift from day to night in the size of the individual fibrils. Whether this is really important, I don't know, but it looks like that in the homeostasis, we have a daytime where we have an active phase, secretion of matrix, but also fragments. And then at night times, we're really recovering in this situation. And that this is a very important point in disturbing this uh, homeostasis in order to develop a, a tendinopathy where you get pain and where you then uh, make a new formation in order to repair this situation. And previously we have shown in a situation where you have a tendon that has been overloaded that if you treat that with strength training, which we know is the best treatment right now, you can actually increase the collagen synthesis as a repair mechanism. If you have then sufficient rest, you will restore the homeostasis in that situation. So ending from here, the taking together where connective tissue not only plays a role in the normal physiology, but also in the injury will be that muscle strain injury is primi primarily an injury of the myotendinous junction. Early mechanical loading rehabilitates the injury faster, most likely by improved collagen formation, but we don't know that yet, by an optimal interplay between muscle cells and fibroblasts. And tendon overuse injury is most likely a disturbed homeostasis of the tendon tissue. A mismatch between daily breakdown and buildup resulting in an accumulation of disorganized proteins, right, rounded cells and water, especially in the region between the fascicle. This is accompanied by early rise and tendon thickening, controlled mechanical loading of this diseased tendon, improved clinical symptoms, most likely 
through a normalization of tendon homeostasis. And with these words and thanking my uh, connective tissue biology group and the entire institute, especially my two uh, senior fellow researchers, Abigail Mack and Peter Magnuson, and also the international uh, collaborators, uh, Carl Katla, Andrew Carr, Stephanie Dakin, Francesco Ramirez, and not the least, Stefano Schiaffino, who we had the pleasure of having here on uh, a visit and where my Abigail Mackey especially has begun a very interesting collaboration on the myotendinous junction with him. I would say that Stefano to me, especially now when I talk to you in Padua, stands as an outstanding researcher who I know has meant a lot and a lightning star in research of the moving body and uh, the uh, skeletal uh, muscle. Once again, thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Herr, for this uh, fantastic presentation, a real state of the art on uh, the muscle and tendon connected tissue. Um, we have uh, 10 minutes for um, available for questions and I'm sure uh, there are quite a few. So I will ask uh, the audience to um, raise questions and uh, but please uh, uh, present yourself and uh, and uh, uh, state a short question uh, so that you give everybody Hi. time to ask, please. Hi, Feliciano Protasi from uh, the University of Chieti. Uh, beautiful presentation. Uh, in the first part of your presentation, you said something about no correlation in between the amount of loading and the amount of protein synthesis. Can you say something more about this? Because it was, uh, I'm not, unexpected, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I fully understand what you're saying. And, and um, I, I mean, that's why I referred to these data where we tried left and right. And this was basically just to address the intensity. And after we did that experiment, I went out and said um, that it's very good that the connective tissue of the muscle is, uh, can do with less loading than we normally would do for, for the muscle because then in the rehabilitation state, you could start early and you could have an advantage because it takes longer time for the connective tissue. And then you can push in the heavy strength training later on. But I must admit over the later years, and we don't have that strong data, it looks like you have to come probably a, above a certain load really to get uh, an impact. And why we were, you can say lucky in this situation with the tendon definitely there are data showing that you need to have a certain intensity to get a response, but, but not many people have looked at the intramuscular connective tissue in this situation. So I have to stick with the data as they are, but, but I totally get, get your point. Maybe my point would be that there maybe is an upper limit. So I think it's, it's, it's still fair to say that you can do loading that doesn't maybe make your muscles grow but they do actually influence the, the connective tissue. Uh, and that, that is very likely. I have been very primitive in my presentation because I only talked about the formation. And this doesn't tell you, I mean, it might be that you, you have a reorganization. So the mechanical properties could be, could be very unrelated to the amount. It could be that it's a bad thing just to make new collagen and you just make some more um, scar. We don't know that, but but I totally get your point, and I cannot I cannot say the full answer here, and I could not say that so many percentage would be needed in order to get this uh, this training. But we've tried recently. There's a recent paper on tendon in in American Journal of Sports Medicine rehabilitation where where we can see that even with tendon going to a lower load, I mean this was 40, 50 percent instead of 70, 80, was very efficient. Um, so. Maybe, yeah. But this good news. So it means that some training is good anyway. Yes, yes. You can always, if, if people, uh, if people are, are uh, let's say, friend, unfriendly to you and tell you that uh, you don't do proper strength training and it's a waste of time, you can say, I'm training my connective tissue. So. Yes, great. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Um, any more questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> well, if I if I may have one, uh, uh, Michael, uh, you showed this very intriguing data of the increase in tendon cross section area 
in uh, marathon runners and these uh, asymmetric uh, sportsmen. And I, I, I always worried, um, worried whether, wondered whether this uh, adaptation is uh, physiological or pathophysiological. Uh, which, which of the two? I mean, for, first, first of all, if we if we study the cross section area, we need to be very. I mean, you would agree on that. That we be, need to be very sure that we don't measure a a rise in size just as the training the day before, because there is a small change just with acute exercise. So we get rid of that. So we'll try to measure people, you know, a few days after the last training bout. So we're just just measuring that. We also, when we do these studies, make sure with ultrasound that we don't see any pathology, you know, and, and of course there could be some micropathology we can't see, but, but we try to make sure that, but, but I'm, I mean, I'm not trying to push that you can make your tendon grow because I really think that, you know, I mean, you have data on that as well. I really think that the tendon doesn't really change that much. And I can say so because the marathon runners who had uh, and strength trained people, volleyball players had, that was an old study, had thicker tendons than, than kayak rowers. And, but that could be selection because they were just, you know, I think the asymmetry is more strong, but, but you know, as well as I, that we have a paper from some years ago where we had people to train running, young people train running for a whole year and they did not change the size of their Achilles tendon one single nano centimeter. So, so, you know, either it's a very long, what I think, what I think is important here is that the adaptability of the tendon probably is there to a large degree when you're young. I mean, you could have a whole presentation on how healthy it should be to train when you're young. So probably with your genes, you, you, you lay out your tendon until you're 15 and then you're stuck with basically <laughs> with, with the core of that. Then you can manipulate a little bit, but that's where you the dynamics is. And that's also why injuries at a very early stage um, very often uh, are easier handled uh, due to that. When you have a rupture of the tendon, that's another story because then the whole, the, 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 even the dormant cell starts again. But I think, I think, um, I think to a large extent, um, the small difference is it, it could be a, um, a physiological thing, yeah. okay. but not, it's not big. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting point. Um, any more questions? Yeah, time for one last question or two short. Okay, so thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I just wanted to focus a point. Uh, you say that the collagen is down-regulated with age, but we know also that uh, we found more collagen tissue in the muscle. So is a problem of uh, remodeling is a problem. What do you think about? I think, I mean, that's a very good point. And I mean, I, I just showed you one side of the coin and you, you just pointed out the other side of the coin that, that the, the general view and has been for many years is that there is more connective tissue in muscle with aging. But the question is whether this is an active phenomenon or it's a phenomenon of uh, muscle cell atrophy. So in many studies, you have percent wise more connective tissue simply because you have less muscle it's not because the connective tissue didn't do anything. It's just, you know, it's just filled out more. So this is really a tricky one to address. Uh, that's why I didn't take a lot of models. I took the one model where the muscle size was approximately maintained, but you could argue that this is a very, very, these are very uh, healthy people, even if they don't train. If you get later on, I mean, it's only at 60. If you get later on, I totally follow your view. You have more connective tissue. We can just not see, even in even older, we cannot see a big upregulation of uh, a new formation. So I'm really puzzled of, of, of um, Todd Trappi had a paper some years ago where they also looked at that and they had difficulty in finding this, this clean upregulation of going from skeletal muscle cell to connective tissue. So that's why I sort of pushed it a little bit and said that I can't really see, and, and I think also the, tr the fact that training really didn't do that much on it. Uh, it's true that you have a lot of more uh, intra intramuscular non-contractile tissue that can be changed with training, but that must be not due to collagen. That would, must be due to fat or something else that can be uh, changed with training. So, yeah. Hey, Michael. 
uh, great to see you, great talk. Uh, I just wondered whether the time course that you were looking at, like one year of exercise training is really enough. You know, from our experience with elite skiers, uh, World Cup skiers, it takes many more years until they can really load their muscles fully. They are limited. We know they're limited by their tendons and it takes them more, takes them several years to get to absolutely the top level they can. And they, you know, they are usually older and they're very good. Have you thought about that? No, no, I, I mean, I, I, I would, I mean, I totally believe you. Uh, I just don't have the data. I mean, I, the data I have is you take people who've done things for a very long time and you compare them with some who haven't. That is, there is, there's no, I mean, there is, that's very clear, both on the Achilles tendon and the patella tendon. The only thing I said was that shorter term studies, and we've tried up to a year, could not show it, but I'm pretty sure that if we measure some of your uh, the skiers and then waited for five years, we would probably see something. I'm um, just for the presentation today, I would like to say that the tendon is adaptable, but I think it's not to a enormous amount. And I think that we should not underestimate how dynamic the intramuscular connective tissue is. Uh, so that was the only thing I totally agree with you. Thank you.